It's been a while, but here I am, back again with another 72 skill World War II fighter. And today we're going to be working with this Edward kit of a Spitfire Mark 9C. The Brophy Pack edition, of course, because Mama didn't raise no bitch. So I'm not going to spend much time looking at this kit because, I mean, it's been built up a million times at this point and everybody probably knows what Edward kits look like. You know, lots of parts, lots of fine molding details, photo etch parts, masks for the canopy, you know the deal. So let's just get right into the building. So one interesting sort of trademark detail of Edward kits is that the cockpit sides are going to be molded in two parts. Uh, the smaller ones and then the more detail on the bigger fuselage half part. This is because Edward is primarily a um, aftermarket parts manufacturer and so for their kits it's easier to replace this cockpit with a, a resin uh, aftermarket replacement this way. As per usual I'm gluing most of the parts together first before painting so it's easier and honestly I was quite surprised at the amount of detail there is here. Maybe it's just because the Spitfire cockpit is really, really crammed, but you know, I'm not complaining. So because I was going to be doing scratch building in this build anyway, as you probably guessed from the title, I decided to add some more details into the cockpit with a bunch of cables and all that good stuff. I'm planning to display this aircraft with the open door and canopy, so most of this will actually be seen this time. And now we come to the main scratch building part of this build. I'm converting this aircraft to a fighter reconnaissance aircraft, which basically means I have to drill out a hole in this access hatch on the side to install a camera. I decided to build the reconnaissance camera myself from replacement parts from older kits that I already built up. I didn't want to spend like $30 on a resin reconnaissance camera that would be mostly hidden out of sight anyway because I'm Eastern European and I'm cheap and my wallet would not let that shit fly under the radar. On the other hand, it's a great opportunity for me to practice my scratch building. While many believe it's not perhaps necessary to have this skill, I actually think it's very very important because, well, with some scratch building you could turn a $30 kit into something that looks like an $80 kit. So after about an hour of work and some test fitting, I got the camera sitting right. And while it doesn't look exactly like the real life camera I was replicating, it serves its purpose because we're really only going to see it from this port in the side. But even with that taken into consideration, I still thought it looked a bit, um, bland for my taste. So I added these uh, support bars that the camera would be situated on, and also some rivets with this uh, rivet punching technique. So I took a drill bit inserted backwards, an eraser, and some tin foil, and just punched out little circular pieces of tin foil, which can act as rivets. All we need to do now is just use a bit of super glue and secure them to the place we want them to be in. Until the result is something like this. One thing I wasn't too happy about in this kit is that the internal uh, structure beams were not present everywhere they should be. So I used the good old stretch sprue technique to put them where they should be on the real aircraft. And while some of them may actually be seen in the finished model, you might find yourself asking, Vilka models, why are you doing this in places where nobody is ever going to see this? And that's a great question. So anyway, I started gluing all the parts together for easier painting because we're finished with scratch building for now. So let's begin by spraying everything with a layer of aluminum from AK Extreme Metal. This serves two purposes. The first is chipping effects inside the cockpit, but the second is that, apart from the cockpit green, the rest of the interior of the aircraft was in bare metal. So the next step in this equation is chipping fluid from ammo. This one is airbrush ready, which, you know, is always great. And at this point, I also masked off the bare metal parts. For the main interior color, I used this shade of Tamiya cockpit green because, well, while it just says it's a cockpit green, I think it's very, very similar to the RAF color they used in World War II. So yeah, that's why I used it. 
So now once we're finished with airbrushing, we can take off the masking tape and stop removing that top layer of green with some water and a toothpick. This will activate the chipping fluid we put on underneath and allow the top layer of paint just to start chipping and flaking away, revealing the metallic color underneath. After that was done, it was time to paint all of the other details inside the cockpit with a brush. For this I use acrylic colors from Vallejo because they have very nice coverage properties and can be thinned down with water. The reconnaissance camera I painted black and just as I was putting the footage together, I read somewhere that these cameras were actually painted a dark blue. And god damn it, this happens every single time! So I managed to convince myself that this isn't really that big of a deal because nobody's gonna actually see the camera anyway, but the paint is still eating me up from the inside. I painted the scratch build cables yellow to make them stand out a bit because painting them black would just be kind of boring in my opinion. The photo edge instrument panel is pre-painted and consists of multiple parts layered on top of each other which gives it a cool 3D appearance. One thing I did to make it look just a little bit better was I took a thin brush and some gloss varnish and painted the dials. This will make them have a glass-like appearance, as if there's actual glass over the dial. And then I secured it in place with some super glue. Followed by more detail painting, well, nothing too interesting here. I just make sure to match my colors to those from reference images of the actual aircraft. One thing I missed during the scratch building stage is that the kit doesn't have throttle lever, so I quickly built one out of wire and placed it where it should be. We can now move on to pin washes and weathering, and for this I used a dark brown wash from Tamiya just to outline a lot of those panel lines. This will give the cockpit a more optically interesting appearance, but also make it a little more dirty, as if there's some grime build up there. At this point, most of the painting was done, and I was ready to assemble all of the parts together. Seat belts in the Spitfire were held into place in a very interesting way, well at least it could be seen from the top of the cockpit, so I, of course I simulated that with some more stretched sprue. Oh yeah, and I also added some rudder control cables, because, I mean, at this point, why not? So let's admire all the work we've done. You see what I mean now when I say this cockpit is very very detailed, and the cables we added make it look even more busy. So before I closed everything up entirely, I quickly cut out a little lens out of some clear foil for the camera we created. To close the fuselage halves together, I use super thin glue in different regions, and then I secure everything with some tape to make sure it doesn't come apart. So, I'm actually replicating a specific aircraft from a photograph, and the real-life counterpart had a cigar-style drop tank on the bottom. Luckily, the kit provides us with an option to install one, so I drill out two holes in the bottom and test fit the drop tank uh, holding arm, just to make sure it fits. Other than that, the wing assembly was pretty straightforward, and everything fit pretty well. One gripe that I have with this kit is that the engine cowling is molded in two halves. This is because this gives us quite a seam line we have to correct right in the middle that happens to run through a lot of detail and rivets, which we'll of course have to rescribe. Honestly, I think Edward overcomplicated things a bit here because, again, a lot of these extra parts we have to put on really could be molded together and to me it really doesn't make sense to have so many of them but I don't know. What do I know about kit manufacturing? When it came to putty I had to fill and re-sand some parts quite a lot because well the fit wasn't exactly aligned perfectly and there were some steps in places especially on the bottom of the fuselage which I had to correct. Of course I destroyed some panel lines and rivets in the process, so I had to rescribe those with a chisel and re-punch some of the rivets with a sewing needle. And yes, this took just about as long and is just as boring as it looks like. But not to worry, I already have a riveting tool on the way. One thing that I noticed people complain about with these models is that these long Hispano 20mm cannons 
tend to break off and are quite fragile. But since they were the same color as the fuselage, I decided to be extra careful and risk having them on from the start. Pre-cut masks are always something I enjoy because cutting your own masks can be tedious, difficult, and take a really long time. Plus, the result is usually much better with them anyway. The very last thing I did was I cut another little piece of clear foil to fit in the camera port in the side. And that's all the time I have for now. So what do you people think? Let me know if you enjoyed the video or even if you learned something new. If you think I did something wrong, then also let me know because I'm always open to criticism, discussion, and learning new things. Don't forget to leave a like on this video and subscribe if you haven't already because the next episode will be all about painting this aircraft. You could also follow me on my Instagram and Facebook pages for in-progress pictures, updates, and all that. I'll link them both in the description. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the video, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.